Good afternoon. Thank you everybody for joining us. It looks like we're gonna have a big crowd today. I'll give us about five minutes for folks to join us. Hi. Is it okay if I post a job announcement in the chat? Oh, hi, Sherwin. Go oh, for hi. it. Good to see you in this space, Sherwin. Uh, good to see everyone here. Sure, when did you post already? Are you? Oh, there it is. I see. Thank you. Uh, the announcement hasn't been updated yet, but then, um, yeah, I was told by someone who's involved in the search that they're pushing back the initial review date until next week. Yeah, so I'm not sure how to how to interpret that. You know, like maybe they're they're looking for more people to um to apply. Oh, is this the big job that everybody's trying to apply for? <laughs> oh, I don't. Oh, I, I yeah, I don't know if everyone's trying to apply for it. Uh, maybe everyone in my life seems to be applying for this job. And I see big smiles. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi. It's nice to see so many uh, friends here. Thank you, everyone. Let me respond quickly. <laughs> Asking for letters of rank for the same job. Huh? No. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, but it's so good to see everybody here. Uh, it's 103. Shall we get started? Is that okay? Not five minutes after the hour and starting now. Um, oh, thank you all uh, for the compliments on my, my clunky glasses. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to the Critical Filipino Philippine Scholars Collective, uh, Critical Filipino Studies Collective brown bag discussion. Uh, my name is Robin Rodriguez. I am going to be helping to moderate the conversation uh, today. Just um, so maybe we can, I wanna just start quickly to just uh, some background and an introduction. So first of all, this is a brown bag and by that, what we mean is that this is meant to be a very casual conversation uh, about uh, the, the big questions that are the, the topic of our conversation today, which is looking at neocolonialism, uh, particularly APEC as a new instrumentality 
although it's not so new, as an instrumentality of neocolonialism. This is a particular concern because uh, neo APEC is going to be coming to the United States, in fact, San Francisco later on this week. We, of course, wanted to use, oh, my, my nose ring dropped. Okay, <laughs> sorry. See, it's so casual. I mean, talking about nose rings dropping out of noses. Anyhow, um, but we also wanted to use this opportunity as as a chance for us to talk about what is happening, the violent, the violent genocide, the genocidal violence that's happening on the Palestinian people. Uh, so we're coming into this space for a couple of reasons. So, so one, um, we we thought that this was such a great opportunity with a Filipino American History Month uh, having just concluded. And the theme uh, of discussion that that uh, the Filipino American National uh, Historical Society had had called for for 2023's Filipino American History Month was actually to look at 125 years of U.S. Philippine relations. And so, some of the reason why we wanted to call this conversation together is I think lots of us notice that FAM, it's now come to be called Filipino American History Month, has become such an activity around people around which people um, convene. Uh, there's always just constant posts about it on social media. There are now huge um, cultural events happening around it. But part of, I think, the concern has been we've shifted away from some of the original intent of uh, Filipino American History Month which is it's an opportunity for us to really center on critical uh, and deep conversations about history. In fact, the late Dr. Don Mabalan would really get irked when people would refer to FAM as Filipino American Heritage Month because Heritage Month, in as much as heritage is an important thing that we celebrate, right? The kinds of cultural traditions that we retain from our ancestral homeland of the Philippines or the new cultural uh, um, practices that we, we that we create in the diaspora, all of that is really important to celebrate, uh, to keep and retain. There is something really distinctive about engaging the history, especially as people of color in the United States, especially as people who were colonized uh, by the U.S. And so, you know, October really is meant to be this time of that sort of critical reflection, but it's sort of become the party month. It's a time when everybody goes to, you know, I mean, I mean, it's festivals galore, right? Everybody's excited about the vendors and the new earrings you can get, the new shirts you can. And so that's fantastic. It's great that there's a proliferation of small businesses and this sort of work, but this is about Filipino American history. And, um, and again, we had this incredible moment in this month to actually talk about the long impact of colonization on the Filipino people. And one of the topics at least was that, that those of us in the, the Critical Filipino uh, uh, Studies Collective noticed wasn't quite being discussed is contemporary neocolonialism in the Philippines. And particularly with APEC coming, um, this real active engagement uh, on the part of the Philippine government in that space, it's been very active in APEC that we're not having that conversation is something that we were hoping to, to sort of address by holding this brown bag. Um, and certainly with the fast shifting um, situation happening um, as we are, are watching in, in horror as uh, the Palestinian people are just being annihilated. We knew that it was also appropriate for us to talk about settler colonialism and to talk about in particular what it means for us as Filipinos to be in solidarity with the Palestinian people. So again, this is a round table meant to be very, very casual in terms of our conversation. Uh, just a real quick background on the collective. So the Critical Filipino Studies Collective is now 20 years old, two decades old. And we started on the streets of San Francisco in a protest. So we were at the time a critical mass of Filipino uh, doctoral students, uh, either uh, studying at nearby universities or in the area doing our research, but we all convened together on the streets of San Francisco uh, at a moment not unlike the moment we're, we're dealing with today. Uh, at, it was 2003, several years after the 9-11 uh, attacks, 
in response to the 9-11 attacks, then U.S. President George W. Bush declared a, declared a global war on terror, which really meant that anybody um, that could possibly be construed as undermining, resisting, uh, contesting U.S. policy in any way, shape, or form could be labeled a terrorist, could be labeled terrorists, and would be necessarily in the United States um, crosshairs. And in 2003, that meant the Iraqi people, the, the, it meant Iraq. And there was a real concern about the kind of violence that was going to be uh, that, that, that the Iraqi people were going to have to suffer at the, um, at the hands of the U.S. military. And in uh, March 2003, we all hit the streets to show our solidarity with the Iraqi people and to show our resistance to war. And, um, you know, we decided at the time, again, Filipino grad students, all working on our doctoral degrees, we thought that it was really important for us to come together as a collective so that we could really uh, better coordinate future actions, whether it meant doing things like what we're doing today, um, uh, sharing our, our knowledge, sharing um, any research that we are doing, or just our skill sets as, as educators and as scholars with the broader community on issues of the day. We wanted to create a space where we could do that. We also wanted to create a collective space where we could register our opposition or our support for issues that might be affecting the Filipino community. Um, you know, and, and why, why we, we, we believed it was important to organize ourselves. We recognized how, you know, individually, and, and this is typically how scholars do it. You have a lot of public intellectuals who kind of use their expertise and stature to speak out on issues, and that's great. But we really draw our um, genealogy to our, 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 our background or, or our inspiration from uh, movements in the Philippines where scholars come together, like in organizations that contend, uh, where we're really there's something far more powerful about coming together collectively and being able to coordinate action than being sort of um, individual scholars who kind of weigh in here and there. There's something about a collective that keeps you accountable um, in addition to being coordinated and allows you to better connect with other movements for social justice. And so we decided the collective was, was the way to go and we've maintained this collective for two decades. Uh, and so, you know, we continue to do this work um, and, you know, I'm proud to say that the, the Critical Filipino Studies Collective, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, that the Critical Filipino Studies Collective has done things like organize ourselves, not just to attend protests, but we've organized ourselves to be able to transform or at least push back within our professional spaces, uh, whether it's been to support Filipino studies scholars who deserve tenure, whether it's been to, um, you know, in the case of the... Uh, the global war on terror, we mobilized ourselves within our professional association to, to get our association to pass a formal resolution to also oppose the war. Um, and later I'll talk even more about it, but we're also very proud to say that we were the collective that helped the conversation to get going around the Association for Asian American Studies passing a resolution in support of the boycott uh, say, uh, uh, divestment sanctions movement or the BDS movement, which is the movement that has been ongoing, which has been encouraging institutions to divest or to issue sanctions um, uh, against um, any kind of um, entities that work towards um, supporting the state of the uh, state of Israel, especially in the context of this long um, occupation and war on the Palestinian people. We were responsible for getting this resolution to the Association for Asian American Studies, getting the Association for Asian American Studies to pass the resolution, which then um, triggered a series of other professional academic associations taking a stand. We're proud of that work. And that's the power of organizing in, in, a, in an organization like this. So um, that's some background on who we are, uh, what we've done. 
Um, you know, for those of you who don't already know me, I'm, I'm sort of in a new kind of capacity, but for the longest time worked as a professor at several major universities, including having founded the Bolosan Center for Philippine, Filipino Studies at UC Davis, which has transitioned out to the Amato Kaya Initiative, and uh, one of the founding members of CFSC two decades ago and trying to maintain as much as possible my, my engagement. And this um, conversation today is being, I'm being joined by uh, Valerie Francisco and Michael Castaneda. I'm not sure if there was other folks from the collective who wanted to also pipe in. I see a bunch of different people here who've been active in the collective in different ways in the last, in the immediate uh, past. Um, Sherwin, of course, has been part of the collective in years past, active in different ways. We have Miguel uh, here as well, and probably others that I can't see because, wow, we've got 74 participants. I didn't anticipate this kind of um, showing, but was there other folks? Because uh, just message me if um, if you all are going to join the conversation. Otherwise, um, I'm going to uh, just focus our conversation with Valerie and and Michael and I'm just going to hand it over to you both to do some introductions and then I'm just going to start us off with some questions again it's a brown bag we're here to kind of you know come to have this conversation and in, um, in a more casual way and and please if you have questions um, uh, put them into the chat We'll try to see what we can address during this one hour, now only 45 minutes. Um, and if we can't address it here, I think that as a collective, we can take up some of the questions and try to answer them in other forms uh, and other formats into the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Val and then Michael. Um, and good afternoon. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction and the invitation really to set up a space. Um, CFSC has been for me, since I was a graduate student, really um, a space and a collective for political um, thinking and developing political theory to advance political struggle. And I think this is the key part about the collective. And I want to welcome everyone here who this might be your first or 17th time sharing space with us. We're grateful and we want to know who you are. So in the chat, please, um, if, if you feel called, please put your name, um, where, where you're Zooming in from, um, how you prefer to be um, called. And, you know, at a certain point in this um, hour long brown bag, we really want to um, open up the conversation in some ways. Um, Michael and I, I don't know, maybe Michael's more prepared than me, but I'm, we, we took brown bag as a come as you are sort of invitation to be in real dialogue as as I am um, a scholar and a, and a professor, I'm also a student um, in many ways, learning from people's experiences and you know the the kind of research and scholarship that folks have to offer up here. Um, apologies, my name is Valerie Francisco Menchavez. Um, I'm at SF State, calling in from Ohlone Ramatish lands. I um, I go by she and they, and um, I just just wanted to point out that Joy Salas um, ha has put the website for CFSC in the chat. Um, and if folks want to continue to be in the loop with our events, we also help a few folks who are in the collective help to write the um, CFSC statement in solidarity with Palestine. Um, if you want to be part of those kinds of efforts or just be in the loop we also, I also pasted the contact form on the website. We're more than happy to um, add you to the most old school way that I know how to get in touch with people, which is a listserv on Google groups. Young people are like, what's a Google group? Anyway, whatever, it's over there. Please um, tap in. Um, Michael, I'm gonna pass to you first on your whatever, you, the cash, super cash um, comments that you have. And maybe, yeah, right, Robin? Or do you want to sort of frame the comments first? Yeah, I could go ahead and frame the comments first, maybe quick introduction from Michael. And then actually Lucy is here and will also be able to join the convo. So Lucy, if you don't mind after Michael, just uh, introduction and we'll start with, uh, it's only really going to be two questions, probably three. <laughs> but I'm sure we have lots to say um, regardless. All right. What's up, everyone? Uh, my name is Michael Castaneda. Um, actually kind of new to the collective um, in terms of 
it's something I've talked to the group before. A lot of my organizing actually comes from, you know, multiracial Black and Chicano spaces. Um, in terms of, I think, you know, I've really learned from Black and Chicano, like, organizing tradition, and they've, you know, taught me how to see my connection to that, right? Um, I think that's something that I, um, you know, try to bring to the collective, bring to critical Philippine studies um, in terms of, yeah, at uh, CCU East Bay, um, come from a long kind of freedom school organizing tradition back in uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, just happy to be here. Uh, and I guess I'll turn it back to, to Robin if um, you want to frame some of the questions. Lucy, did you want to join in real quick with an introduction? Sure, sure. And I'll I'll turn my cam on for this and then I'll turn it back on. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Sabi niyo, uh, brown bag uh, casual lang. Yeah, so, exactly. Very casual. Very casual. Put red lipstick. That's it. Just to make it. Hindi. Hindi ako nag lipstick. Anyway. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's such an honor to be to be part of this. And thank you so much for the invitation. Um. I think I'm one of the co-founders <laughs> and I can't believe it's been 20 years ago and really it's such a an incredible moment I I hope not to get emotional um you know this collective starting really from you know like the events of 9/11 following that and and um Palestine always being always kind of in the center of of um how we conceived solidarity and anti-empire work. So this is such a critical time more than ever to really speak up uh, and join and, you know, everything, ceasefire, free Palestine. This is it, everyone. And the role and our, wherever we are, right, to make accountable our, um, our, our government, each other for what's happening and what's being done to Palestinian people. Um, so I, like I said, I, I, I guess I was one of the co-founders um, of the collective over 20 years ago and um, was not uh, going to school in the in California. I was actually coming back to California after having gone to, was finishing my dissertation. Um, so found these wonderful brown people. Um, I was in Santa Cruz for a minute. So that's how I, you know, I met Robin, Arisa. Um, Joanne Rondelia, just I mean naming us the names here. Um, Gladys Nubla, um, uh, Richard Chu. Um, I'm going to forget the others. I'm sorry, um, but yeah, the, uh, uh, Jeff Santa Ana, of course Peter Chua, Rowena Tamaneng. I mean these are incredible people who brought community to me after having you know uh returned back to to california um and yeah just it started off really just finding you know kind of kindred spirits our our shared work around critique of empire um and also just wanting to think about our at that point thinking about different publics um, and again, like what Robin said about being able to use our skills in different ways, right, to speak to to others um, and each other. So, yeah, so that's that's who I am and how I ended up joining. But the other thing I want to say is that what the collective brought to me then, like I said, is the community I did not have. I was, you know, I had other kinds of communities, but certainly not. Um, Filipino or Filipinx, Filipinx diaspora uh, scholars from where I was coming from. So this was such a gift to have that and be be with others who are, again, kindred spirits and politically um, kind of along the same lines to, and we can support each other. Um, did a, Wrote a lot of um, um, <laughs> statements, uh, wrote a lot of uh, PSAs, <laughs> Um, learned how to do that on the ground. Um, yeah, and you know, did, did a lot of chanting and running around. Best part of it is all y'all is running around the streets of San Francisco, like you do cartwheels. It's like I love it. It's like my favorite thing. Public action, you know. And we did some of that in Mexico City too. I remember. 
Um, all right, I'll end there and then we'll, I'm sure there's more to say. So thanks so much for the space. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. Yes, you are definitely there. And we have pictures, so we got receipts. <laughs> um, but um, I did post in the chat if people are okay with maybe extending the conversation just a little past the hour, 15 minutes. I'm just, my sense is that people, there's a real need for extended conversation. And we're tackling really two very um, interconnected and yet also very major kinds of issues here. I mean, a lot of one of the conversations we wanted to be able to have is around neocolonialism and particularly APEC as an instrumentality of neocolonialism, uh, while also speaking to uh, a Filipino uh, Palestinian solidarity. Um, and, you know, again, there's a lot to be said about both, but I do want to start first with um, a discussion around neocolonialism. And so, and this is really open to any of the three of you, I might pipe in myself, but how in, in, in the work that you do as scholars, but also um, as people who are teaching on these topics, how do you talk about neocolonialism um, in the Philippines and how it's sort of um, contemporary manifestations? I could, I'll probably pick up on the APEC piece, but if anybody can even speak more broadly about the ways that, you know, again, uh, going back to the theme that Fonz called for for this year, 125 years of U.S.-Philippine relations. We know, and you know, there has been a bit of conversation. I think it, by now people know about the Philippine-American War, and then sort of the conversation sometimes ends there. But in, how do we, how do you kind of grapple with or just talk about neocolonialism as as something that continues um, over a decade? Um, you know, not a decade, but like a century um, and, and more. Anyone want to pick that up? Can I, can I go, Rob? And this is just, again, just very simple. I'll talk about, um, I teach a class, two classes or several classes at UCLA. I'm a faculty member in the Asian American Studies Department there for the last couple of decades. And one class that I inherited is called the Filipino American Experience. And one class that I developed as part of the um, Filipino studies minor, which is housed in the Asian American studies department, everyone. So just want to um, let you know that I we are uh, very lucky to have had the support and I was able to move forward um, with the minor. I think it's one of the few Filipino studies minor that exists in a U.S. academy. So um, um, so anyway, I teach several courses that in within that through the Asian American Studies Department, and um, I guess uh, just uh, I think this will s s answer some of that of, of your question, Rob's, uh, but maybe open it up to other things. Um, in the way that I've approached the Asian American Studies, or sorry, what's called the I keep changing the name, but it's called I think I inherited that Filipino American experience. So um, it's actually, you know, to start off with um, the uh, Luzon Indios and um, Manila men and um, to really kind of challenge the, what the scholar um, uh, from, UC, from CSU, San Luis Obispo, Native American scholar, and she, what she calls first things to really challenge that, you know, like to kind of um, think about when we invoke those first arrivals, if you will, right? Um, and and in the process of that kind of erase indigenous communities and the civilization that's already that, that's already in progress that was actually interrupted, right? By these by the um, by the age of discovery, if you will, right? So that's um, so I think I push you know, kind of ex extend out of the U.S. Philippine relations in that centering the war, the, you know, the acquisition of the Philippines as a U.S. territory, but be, you know, even before that, right? Um, there's so much pride around, oh yeah, Asian, uh, Philippines is the first Asian am, but what's what's really to kind of interrogate and question, what is the pride about, right? Um, and when we're calling for a sense of belonging, what are we calling, a, what are we asking to belong to, right? And so, the way that I frame the class is really about um, the age of destruction and and the fall of Western civilization, from you know, because that's the history of of um, of empire. 
and, and, and discovery. So that's how I started. And it sort of begins from there. And then, you know, there's, you know, that moment of 1946 with supposedly the independence of the Philippines, but really kind of more of a transition of a continuing uh, in, in a relationship that continues to be closer, but around militarization, capitalism, exploitation, you know, and the decent even relationship between two, to these two countries. So that's how it, it the I sort of continue the framing of these uneven relationships and, and, and histories of exploitation and, and continuing resistance. So. I, don't, <clears throat> I could jump in and kind of piggyback off of that. Uh, I think for me, um, center line, centering the through line of just state violence, like that's, let's name it for what it is. Um, I think one person I've been turned to, particularly since, um, you know, what's happening in Gaza right now is just act of settler colonial violence. I think turning to, you know, indigenous scholars and scholars of settler colonials to like really try to think through this as we center that, as we center, um, you know, thinking through Philippine neo neocolonialism, I think is important. I think for me, I've, um, you know, I've really turned to, um, Manu Karuka's work, Empire's Tracks, is a line where he's thinking through like indigenous feminist writers and theorists. And he says, colonialism transforms abundance into scarcity, interdependence into isolation. Colonialism in all its forms is a profound failure at being human, right? You know, so I think one, just kind of naming what we're witnessing in Gaza, what we, and kind of, and just kind of the through line of US empire everywhere, I think naming it as a failure to be human in real time is something just to kind of hold and to uh, put out there. Um, you know, also I think in terms of kind of thinking through that through line of state violence, whether we're talking about the Philippine American War, we're talking about the 1901 Sedition Act that named all forms of resistance to US colonialism as, as criminalized, right? you know, understanding those connections to that's a product of, you know, you know, slavery and settler colonialism moving to the Philippines in terms of kind of thinking about there's a longer history of criminalizing acts of resistance against white supremacy and empire as criminal acts. Um, I think just kind of thinking about the through line, particularly in, in my work, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, particularly I look at like the anti-martial law movement in the US, um, particularly it's most like radical formations in terms of like the Union Democratic Filipinos and the KDP. Um, and, um, you know, I've been blessed to be able to have been mentored by, you know, some of the folks in the KDP in Seattle and develop close relationships with them. Um, and just kind of learning about the murders of Sony Domingo and Jean Viernes, like in terms of, I think one of the lines that really stood out to me from one of the KDP activists that was writing in that time, um, Rene Cruz, he said in reference to uh, this trans-Pacific act of state violence of taking the lives of anti-martial law activists who are doing work within Alaska salmon canneries, trying to make connections. Um, Rene Cruz said, um, the imperialist policy that the U.S. government was to conduct wants to conduct with impunity, referring to the U.S. aid for martial law in the Philippines, not only means authoritarianism, authoritarianism abroad. It means an impulse for authoritarianism, authoritarianism at home. Right. So, in terms, of, I think, I think something that the um, this long kind of radical tradition of Filipino organizing not only kind of builds kind of connections between what's happening in the US, what's happening in the Philippines, but also um, really understands that supporting, you know, repressive kind of state violence abroad comes back, right? And I think particularly in this moment as, you know, USA to Israel intensifies and resistance intensifies, I think learning from kind of these movements of how, um, you know, thinking about how folks have 
you know, defended themselves, created kind of defense committees, tried to kind of think about how, um, you know, the lessons that that has for other communities in struggle um, is also part of kind of the history of neocolonialism that you, we could think through in this kind of historical context too. Um, so I'll just leave it then. Thank you so much, Michael. And as you, um, as, as folks have been talking, I've tried really hard to kind of just put some resources. Uh, I'm not really sure, you know, where everybody's coming from, but, you know, and, and that's also, again, why we wanted to do this brown bag. I think that there is, in as much as, um, you know, it's wonderful that we have social media as a, as a platform where lots of people can share lots of different kinds of information. I think part of the thing that we can offer as scholars, um, and that's not to, to center people who are experts, but to recognize we do bring a kind of skill set and it is part of our work to read, to dive deeper. Um, so part of the work of our collective is to provide that, um, you know, uh, either resources that um, can invite people to dive deeper or to directly uh, share our knowledges. So um, I've tried to just put some, some of those resources into the chat. They're scholarly resources. And, you know, again, I'm hoping that as we continue to work together as a collective that there will be opportunities to uh, for us to collectively unpack things that uh, might be harder um, for people to process if they're they haven't been in a space of academia for a long time but want to do some deep learning. And then, of course, for those of you who I do know are in academia, some great resources that may be outside your fields that might be important. And I think you know when when we think about what is a curriculum of a critical. Philippinex or Filipino studies scholar. I think you know the kinds of references that have already been um, named by Lucy and Michael are great uh, in terms of you know the kinds of vital work of folks in the space of Native American studies, Indigenous studies, um, other kinds of historical work on um, the Filipino radical tradition here in the U.S. I just wanted to share that I've been trying to post into the chat, and hopefully we can even follow up. So please do sign up because there can be. Um, hopefully we'll have a chance um, after this event to compile some of these resources to share out to those of you who are present today. Val, did you, I wanted to tap you in to kind of have to also contribute to um, this conversation about neocolonialism. How do you think about it? How do you teach about it? How does it show up in your work? What are some of the manifestations of neocolonialism? Yeah, um, Lucy and Michael, always thankful to be in conversation and learning from y'all. Um, you know, my work is generally looking at Filipina migration and domestic work. Um, I'm interested really in transnational families and the politics of care. Um, as Dr. Kat Nassau, um on the screen here has taught me through her dissertation around the governance of care, really the neoliberal governance of care. Um, I'm quite interested in the global and the intimate in that sort of relationship. And I often think about as a sociologist, the structures and systems of neocolonialism as it impacts sort of everyday life and, um, and everyday decisions, everyday relations, the way that we build relationships, the way that we hold relations with one another. And I think um, as Robin said earlier, in just, you know, with APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting happening here in San Francisco, um, just in a few days, and sort of the way that the current president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos, um, the second or junior, whatever, the, you know, the dictator son, um, has positioned themself, himself as someone who is continuously literally giving the Philippines lands away, right? They, he's been very involved with the Indo-Pacific Indo economic framework, um, really allowing for foreign ownership of Philippine lands, really um, moving away from um, uh, the industrialization uh, and not, the, not just industrialization, but the development of livelihood for Filipinos in the Philippines. Um, which is directly in sort of in conversation with what I've been trying to think about in the past decade in my work is like, how do those big economic frames, these political frames that 
don't often feel like, oh, it often feels like out there or like kind of hovering above us. How does it impact our everyday lives? And for many ways, this sort of um, political and economic um, occupation and presence in the Philippines is a form of neocolonialism that is actively um, actively built on the separation of Filipino families and sort of gendered ideologies in the Filipino family schema. And I think about that a lot in my research um, to sort of analyze what do those big sort of systems, APEC, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, neoliberalism, what does it have to do with our everyday lives? And then I, and then I think second, um, I don't, oftentimes um, in the past few weeks with the attacks in Gaza um, escalating to almost 10,000 Palestinians claimed by Israeli um, and US backed um, military uh, bombardment, I have also been thinking a lot about um, the kinds of solidarities that are needed at this moment, um, really as a way for me to find my bearings in such a in such a cruel world. And uh, and a big part of what I am am writing about currently, and you know, um, MA candidate Nell Garcia's. Is also writing on this these ideas around uh, the ethics of care in the diaspora as a, as a praxis of solidarity, as a praxis of activism um, that also takes up sort of these huge concepts. And so I do want to say that like um, for those of us who are trying to understand these sort of big players in these macro ways that we can, it's it's quite easy for us to also look at our right everyday interactions as a reflection of some of those problematic things, but also as a resistance and a negotiation to those kinds of powers that be. Thank you, Valerie. And, and I'll just kind of, I'll pipe in myself as well. I mean, just in terms of in my own teaching when I was in the university and when I try to talk about neocolonialism in the community, I often really like to actually start with um, the moment of so-called independence. And so I often will just share the actual, the Philippine constitution of that moment. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, in the Filipino community, when we think about independence, the way it's celebrated popularly, we always mark June, June 12th, which really marks this moment of uh, independence from Spain when we declared ourselves, right? And independence in that, you know, in, in that anti-colonial struggle. And we often don't actually talk about the moment of 1946, um, which ostensibly was which marked our formal independence from the United States. And I think a really great tool that I, uh, I, I use is to just look at the Philippine constitution. It is really crazy when you look at the 1946 constitution, how it's ingrained in this founding document, which by the way, was, you know, independence for the Philippines was granted uh, as an act of US Congress, right? Not an assertion on the part of the Filipino people. Um, but, you know, we, it's ingrained in the constitution how much US economic and military interest was just right there and preserved and really has largely um, remained preserved to this day. And I like to use that because it, in some ways it says it all. So then when you wanna, you know, jump ahead to this moment of APEC. And again, you know, APEC actually has been around since the late 80s. Um, the APEC stands for the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And so it's a it's a space where uh, uh, various states in the Asia Pacific um, region uh, gather to have conversations about how to basically advance a neoliberal agenda, right? So what is neoliberalism? So Okay, I'm gonna have, I have a prop. <laughs> so this book now, and this is my first book. It's from, oh God, oh, 2010. Oh, but still, I think there's some relevant stuff. So if people don't, you know, haven't had a chance to read it. I talk a little bit about what is neoliberalism, um, you know, very, very uh, briefly, but, you know, neoliberalism is, is a kind of, um, it's an economic uh, framework or an economic philosophy, right? Um, around, uh, 
that has really been advanced um, globally. That's what we often refer to as neoliberal globalization, right? And so some of the key precepts or core um, notions that kind of constitute a neoliberal uh, economic framework is privatization, uh, uh, liberalization, privatization, and deregulation. And so these are Basically, you know, deregulation is what we're seeing all the time. Uh, we don't often name it here in the U.S., but all the things that prevent corporations, um, all the laws that prevent corporations from just, you know, hyper extraction of resources from the earth, um, those, uh, that is the deregulation of all of those kinds of, um, of, uh, of those frameworks that try to stop that is an example, that's an example of deregulation, right? And so um, uh, spaces like APEC become the, the space, the, the, the place where governments have these conversations about how to enact policies, um, national policies, or even firm up uh, agreements between one another to ensure that um, these various, um, uh, that, that, all of that flows of, of, of capital and labor um, are such that capitalists, right, big businesses, big corporations can always feed their bottom line, right? And so, you know, deregulation is one core principle or pillar of neoliberal uh, globalization, uh, but there's also um, um, the liberalization of trade. So in other words, um, you know, this is where uh, the U.S. Uh, would want to be able to have um, easy access, right, to kind of Philippine marks, uh, markets, economic markets without any hindrance, even if, for instance, um, uh, the uh, Philippine local um, producers might be threatened by the influx of, of U.S. products that basically uh, the liberalization of trade would allow for that to happen with no protections uh, for Filipinos. That's one example of you know, uh, new, uh, uh, liberalization. Uh, privatization is uh, basically you know, different goods that um, might be provided by uh, the state or the government like healthcare or even education actually becomes um, performed by private entities. Um, and so you know, I think Val's work definitely is able to look at how all of these big economic policies that sometimes, you know, there, there are names for them, right? There's a lot, there, there's these philosophies that govern them. They manifest in different kinds of policies uh, or, or um, laws or agreements, but then what does it actually mean for everyday people? And Val's work, of course, uh, is able to, to really look at that, right? It means that people are forced to have to migrate. It means that families are apart. It means that people have to pay for health care by earning a living abroad. There are all of these kinds of things, right? So um, you know, that's kind of how I've been thinking. I, I, I think about um, and long been thinking about um, uh, uh, neocolonialism in the Philippines, uh, neoliberalism, and how that then connects to the Asia Pacific economic cooperation. And, you know, we can't go into the deep, deep dive, but hopefully, you know, you've got some resources for those of you who are still kind of at the beginnings of your, you know, an understanding of this um, that you can kind of begin to work with. And I'm putting into the chat, there has been a big movement. Um, you know, there is a big uh, struggle in opposition to APEC um, as a framework and certainly the meeting of APEC in San Francisco. I've just shared into the, um, um, the chat uh, a link tree that has a bunch of really great resources for folks who are wanting to dive in. Of course, you know, if you already know, you know, that this is clearly something that is not a good thing for the peoples of the world, there are mobilizations to attend and be part of. Um, and, you know, I have to say, just as a personal kind of note, I was able to attend over 20 years ago, the anti-APIC mobilizations in the Philippines. And I think that was really the, the participating in that is what set me on the kind of course that I, I find myself on today. Um, I was a young graduate student at the time. Uh, that was the, where I was able to really see um, just how amazingly organized um, the Filipino people are. It was incredible to see tens of thousands of people on the street um, and, and from all walks of life uh, with not just an understanding of how these economic policies were going to impact them, but also um, taking the, the step to, to stand up against it. And um, that's where I was able to meet other uh, professors 
uh, who were part of the organization Contend. I think that that's probably where some of the seeds of thinking that we could do something like that later on, um, you know, several years later when we ended up uh, forming CFSC. So, um, you know, that that's that, that's a resource I really want to point folks to. And just to let folks know, I put it into the chat, had not articulated it, but I have invited um, uh, Lucy, Michael, and Valerie to linger for just for 15 minutes extra if they're able, um, just to continue the conversation just because it's clear that we have such a, a huge audience here. People are really, really trying to um, learn uh, with us. And so, um, you know, I want to also give us enough time to be able to address uh, Filipino-Palestinian solidarity. And that's what I want to turn to now um, is to talk about our histories of Philippine um, uh, Filipino uh, Palestinian solidarity. I actually wanted to, to turn to Mike if that was okay, because Mike, I know that your work, Michael, your work has been uh, looking at this long history of solidarity. Maybe you could even talk about like third worldism. You know, I think that for some folks may not even understand this idea of a third world, um, you know, a third worldist framework. You know, I mean, it's, I, I think that. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we, again, in the moment of social media, when we're kind of the here and the now, and we can go real deep, real fast in the now, we don't often get a chance to kind of reach further, be, uh, you know, further back historically. So maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe um, kind of Filipinos and, and Palestinians, and maybe kind of the broader framework of third worldism that really <laughs> is, you know, what's part of the motivation for, or, or yeah. why we come together. Thanks. No, for sure. I mean, uh, one, if we want <clears throat> just a concrete resource, uh, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Center for Political Education based in the Bay Area, San Francisco, but they created, uh, you know, one, this is a political education, um, kind of like coalition of different grassroots organizations that wanted to come together to like grow their, their politics um, together in conversation, right? So one of the initiatives they did in, um, I think 2018, was they created um, a series of political education workshops and a reader called The Spirit of 1968. Um, after I speak, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> put it, uh, find it in the chat, um, or find it online and put it in the chat. Um, one uh, that just kind of frames the broader, you know, really kind of focusing on 1968 as a moment of global revolution, right? From, you know, uh, the work of the Communist Party of the Philippines, thinking about um, um, anti-imperialist struggles throughout Southeast Asia. Um, and a broader, I think, just thinking about uh, Sir World Liberation. Um, I think it's interesting when I share this with students, so many students have a negative connotation of the term the third world. Right, and I, that's something I think in our political work, um, you know, as we kind of, if our, you know, historical kind of education is part of our political work, I think really understand, I think from the 1950s to the 1970s, uh, the power of attaching ourselves to kind of third world liberation projects. Um, also like a more academic text, the folks are kind of looking for it. Uh, BJ Prashad's The Darker Nations is like, a broader kind of, um, you know, it's, it's case studies, but in terms of it tries to tell a larger kind of historical story. Um, but really in terms, of, I think one aspect of several liberation really comes out of, you know, this period of the Cold War as movements were, as national liberation struggles were winning. They also, um, you know, created a series of forums to kind of come together, kind of come together like this right, come together not only to, um, you know, think about their objective conditions and kind of the unfinished projects of their liberation struggles, but to actually imagine a world uh, where colonialism and the various manifestations of colonialism doesn't exist, right? Um, and I think just in terms of one aspect of thinking about third world, um, solidarities in this, I think in this moment, is I think there's a way in which sometimes folks kind of see it as kind of collapsing kind of these like different kind of experience, whether you're talking about what it means to be a person of color in the US and attaching to the third world or different kind of different regions. But I think 
third world solidarity was really a commitment to seeing the end of colonialism, right? And I think that's something that folks really, um, I think, attach to. One in terms of, um, you know, in terms of thinking about the connections between the Philippine and Palestinian liberation struggles, I think um, I've really looked at it in the context of the murder of Sami Domingo and Jean Viernes and um, kind of the solidarities that really formed after that in the context of Sami Domingo and Jean Viernes were murdered in their own union hall in 1981. It was a product of pushing their international union, the International Longshore Men and Warehouse Men Union, to build an alliance and support with the Kilosang Mayo Uno, which was a labor federation of the Philippines that was radical in its economic demands, but also um, and part of those economic demands were calling for nationalizing industries and really a critique of you know, the martial law regime's um, neoliberal kind of economic vision of development in the Philippines, right? Um, but something, you know, like I found from like having conversations with activists during this time period where um, after the murders, um, they developed kind of a massive like um, campaign, not only to get justice for Sumi Domingo and Jean Viernes, but they really saw their murders as a, as a sign of a broader system of, of state repression that was you know, happening in the US and kind of tied to that idea of supporting repression abroad is gonna lead to you know, state violence at home, right? So, I mean, I think to be kind of brief, I mean, the one thing that was kind of apparent from conversations I've had with activists and in the archives is um, there was always a close relationship between um, Palestinian um, activists and Philippine activists. Um, also, and the last thing that I would say is in 1987, as kind of, you know, Marcos is ousted from power, um, you know, and kind of, it becomes easier to charge him with his culpability in kind of these egregious acts of state violence and the killings of some of the Domingo and Jean Viernes. Um, there was, um, a close political relationship that the Committee for Justice for Sunni Domingo and Jean Viernes developed with a group of uh, Palestinian activists in LA. In terms of seven Palestinian activists were being charged with deportation for their support of Palestinian liberation, right? And to me, like, I think this is kind of um, a really important historical example to lift up, not just to say that there's parallels between our historical experience, but there's actually, at least if we go back to the 1980s, there's a long history of actually working together around, um, you know, in solidarity in very concrete forms and also kind of envisioning, you know, our victories, our liberations as tied to each other, right? You know, so one thing that comes out of the movement in Seattle, you know, that's where Sumi Domingo and Jean Viernes were based in, was this concept of no separate peaks, right? And the idea is even if like Marcos is ousted, even if, you know, he's um, charged with the murders of these US-based activists, as long as these practices of oppression are still existing, you know, our victory, we haven't found victory, right? You know, so I think that's, just, um, you know, one example of the fact that there is kind of this long history of working in kind of place-based solidarity with one another. Thank you so much for that, Michael. Did you want, did uh, Lucy, uh, Val, did you want to pipe in? And also, you know, I've been again trying to um, address some of the questions um, in the chat um, folks who may not be familiar with the Silme Dominguez, uh, Domingo, my bad, and Jean Viernes case, um, really important labor leaders uh, who were able to rally opposition in their union against the Marcos dictatorship. Um, there are more, there are other resources out there um, uh, as well, but um, very specifically to that case, uh, there's uh, the Ron Chu book. Um, there's also the KDP reader. 
uh, for the broader context of the struggle at that of the anti-martial law struggle, other kinds of uh, texts out there too. Jose Diaz has uh, written about you know the martial law moment. Just uh, th that book has come out uh, relatively recently. Um, Joy, we're excited about the book that you're writing, <laughs> uh, Salas, um, and also already has some uh, you know uh, publications for that, mm, and Michael as well. Um, so. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can get folks signing up for our listserv and uh, we can reconvene as a collective to try to share these out in another format as well. Um, but yeah, Lucy or or Valerie, any other um, things you want to be able to share around um, uh, Filipino, um, uh, Filipino, uh, Palestinian solidarity, or even just and there's the other piece, right, which is the state of the Philippines and um, yeah. and Zionism and is and Israel. And I know Lucy, you had shared a really great resource the other day that kind of looked at the map of um, yeah. the military. Um, uh, you know, which states around the world um, have benefited, have purchased, right? Um, the most. Uh, right. Yeah. So maybe you can speak to that, or you know, and, yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and look it up and share it, but maybe folks have seen it already. Um, but first, I wanted to just say um, thank you, Michael. That, that was really incredibly informative. And I look forward to hearing more about um, these, to how you're tracing these, you know, kind of direct collaborations and coalition, coalitional work. Um, I also wanted to, because I just finished um, this section in my class, so I shared a, a documentary film um on uh Jean Vernes and Somi Domingo. Um lots of incredible um you know uh uh Kasamas who were you know who were with them friends um relatives or their uh loved ones speaking about who they are as as a, as you know as as a people and organizers and uh, and really kind of directly linking you know the work that they did and and how you know they the the Marcus government was found guilty right of conspiring that murder um so it's I think the the documentary film is very useful so I just want to say that I sent that link up here um um I also wanted to just to talk a, a little bit about the the statement and how we approached it um I, I really loved working with the collective on this and the kind of work that, you know, how we, how it came together. Um, it was a very, you know, everyone is really busy, but we know how important it was. And so we just started this document. And what, what's important that I want to say is that because the co different members of the collective are connected with other collectives, right. Working already with, um, you know, with, um, in support of Palestine, it was really important for us to center what the call was from the Palestinian people and the Palestinian activists, right? Um, and so that was very clear. And out of that is how we created the the statement. I think that's really important and maybe too obvious to say in this group already. But um, when it comes to these statements, like for this, there was an actual call. There are specific calls from at the time, anyway, this is October 20th. We're already how many weeks into after that? So the the statement was released October 20th. We started working on it five days or four days before that. And at that time, the call was ceasefire, right? Ceasefire and, um, and you know, making sure that we take care of each other. Like, I think that sort of signaling to several things already happening now, the kind of McCarthyism, if you will, that is, that is on in this country in terms of our universities, um, the, the criminalizing of those who are supporting the Palestinian cause. Um, and, you know, there's going to be losses here. And so it's really important for us to to, make, to be in collectives um, because this is the only way that, that any, like this is going to really, you know, make an impact and we need each other at this time. So that was really important as part of the call. Um, and uh, and also, uh, also different kinds of actions that can be done. And so that's how it was organized. But what, what's really also so incredibly informative and educational, I think, about the statement is, um, I think Alan Lumba included a lot of this information is really how tied the Philippines 
through the U.S. with Israel, right? And I'm trying to look for the visual here that I share that I find. And it's, and it's um, please follow Visualizing Palestine if you're on Instagram, because they have been putting out incredibly informative, like very just searing, direct, um, you know, undeniable information out there um, in this like really useful um Oh, I, I can't share it. Uh, Rob's, if you give me share anything, I can show it to you. But basically, this um, this visual is, is which countries imported the most Israeli weapons in the last five years. And number one is actually India. You have, sh you have sh share screen. Yeah, oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. All right, let's try. Okay, here it is. And so this is the other thing, again, probably too obvious to this group, but I'll just say it anyway, because, um, you know, <laughs> I didn't grow up in, in social media, so to speak. Um, but, you know, there are certain folks that we're being asked to follow. That's folks who are on the ground in uh, in Palestine, who's still able to, in Gaza, who's still able to broadcast, right, information. Um, and uh, and certain groups. So, again, that's on the, some of that is in the statement of, everyone. So if you're interested, please check it out in the statement and just start following and reading uh, and supporting those those um, resources because they're they're really doing the work for us. Because um, if you're watching regular news, you're not going to get it there. <laughs> I um, Okay, so here we have India as the number one, again, who's um, uh, imported most Israeli weapons in the last five years. Second is Azerbaijan, right? Third is the Philippines, right? This is, again, news to me. It's just not necessarily something I follow, but to see this is so incredibly powerful. And it's only the U.S. is fourth, right? So Philippines is actually in the one the, the, one of the top three um, importers of Israel, Israeli weapons the last five years. So I'm sure, like, at some point, if we do sort of we track who, where these weapons are going and how they're being used. I think that's an incredible collective project that we can look into. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, so, but the other thing is like, sorry, Rob, just one quick thing about the neoliberal, um, neoliberalism. I want to point out like, a, you know, it's a longer conversation to think about neoliberalism and the idea and, and it's con and how that's could and how we're connected to that in terms of U.S. exceptionalism. I think that's the other thing here that connects us to, you know, what uh, what what's happening in Palestine and and the un un uh, blinking support of the United States to Israel, the United States government, I should say, with Israel is really we need to understand. If we don't understand what U.S. exceptionalism is, I think if we start to understand that, then it will make sense why the U.S. Um, has this kind of bear hug, whatever so, <laughs> relationship with with uh, with um, with Israel. How do you stop sharing? Okay. Um, so so no, the other. Oh, sorry. sorry yeah, ahead, sorry, Rob. See, I, I guess oh. that one other thing that's interesting to me with APEC is one of this, you know, like this, the smart city project that they have, um, which to me is that surveillance, y'all, like, you know, how they're going to use surveillance. And if you want to know how surveillance is like, has been perfected. West Bank and Gaza. Look at that. Look that up. That's what these smart cities are going to look like, everyone. So I just want to point that out. Thanks, Rob. No, thank you so much for all of that, Lucy. And I did want to kind of link it and hook uh, this conversation back into yes, the conversation that we had started about uh, around um, neocolonialism, neoliberalism, and to answer the questions: Why the Philippines? Why would the Philippines want to buy all these weapons? Because neoliberalism goes hand in hand with militarization. Why? Because you cannot squeeze that much from people without them rising up in resistance. And when they're rising up in resistance, that is a problem of corporations. And the best way to deal with resistance is repression. That's the connection. And so when we're looking at the Philippines and um, that's why it's no accident, right? Um, it doesn't matter that it's, whether it's Bong Bong or somebody else, even just the very, the celebrated Cory Aquino, right? Who represented the opposition to the Marcos regime. 
was also very much committed to this neoliberal agenda and also deployed, right, policing and military against those who would, would resist. Who are the resistors? It's the land defenders, indigenous land defenders. It's peasant farmers. It's workers in factories. And so, you know, and this is why, you know, it becomes so important to talk about, you know, and, and looking it all together, right? All of these things are interconnected, right? There is a fascism, militarization, you know, neoliberalism all going hand in hand. And, 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 and again, when we're talking about why, um, the, the, why this solidarity with, with the, with this Palestinian people um, becomes so vital, right? There is, in as much as our struggles might be distinctive, there is this deep kind of connection um, that we share in common. Um, there were a couple of, there was a question around, gosh, so many things. And um, I think I think we've answered the whole issue around the weapons um, and why, and where does the Philippines get the money? I mean, sometimes that's coming from the US. You know, I mean, that's part of how the flows happen, right? Um, US kind of um, pledging certain kinds of aid to the Philippines that then the Philippine state uses, you know, because again, part of how the, the Philippines, um, you know, complies with the neoliberal um, economic order is, you know, accepting certain kinds of aid, um, you know, being in compliance with certain kinds of policies. And, and, and this is all, and, you know, and, and this is not so new. I mean, we've seen this pattern repeat itself over and over again. And again, why we wanted to have this conversation we need to be, a, you know, as much as, you know, we can doom scroll or kind of go deep, deep, deep down in the present. We need this expansive view. We need to have this historical perspective. We need to be able to understand kind of where the patterns emerge. And, you know, I think this is, if somebody, I wanted to tackle the question that Kat Nassau, Dr. Kat Nassau, um posed in, in the chat around, you know, uh, this moment. Um, wait, I think I lost it. Oh, there. That Kat has been talking about this new phase of war. State surveillance has increased. There is AI listening, right? Doxing, harassment of activists, et cetera. Um, how do we prepare ourselves for this new space of war as activists, researchers, educators, structures of care and survival that we need to create? I think Lucy sort of spoke to that. I think this is why all the more it becomes, you know, maybe it's sort of a, an old solution to a seemingly new problem, which is organize, uh, come together. This is how we create a space of care. Uh, for example, you know, we have other members of this collective who could not show up in this space for various reasons, whether it's other kinds of commitments, perhaps some concerns about what the consequence might be to show up in this space, right? Because there are real consequences, right? Um, the right wing Zionists are coming after people and they're relentless. Um, but, you know, you come together in collective. These are things that we can share, you know, that people can cycle through. People... Uh, who have more capacity cycle in, we can coordinate, we can organize, we can share, we can hold each other with care, um, you know, to, to commiserate sometimes, to share strategies, um, but why it's so important to organize. And, and it's probably the thing we know least how to do in the United States, right? The fact of the matter is we, how many of you are part of an actual organization where you know you signed up to become a member and that you have a certain accountability um, as a member to that organization or that you signed up because you believe in what they stand for and you know that as a member you're going to be you know part, part you know active participant to uh the, the vision and mission of that organization that is not a common thing for for Amer for people in the US right the labor movement although it's great now you see new renewed activism in labor so that was that is now a place where people can join where where unions are able to be formed you can join a union, um, but you know we don't have a lot of people's organizations in the United States, right? We have lots of nonprofits, and a lot of nonprofits are taking the lead actually in the struggles now, which is fantastic. But there's not even a mechanism sometimes to even join an organization, right? Um, so part of the work I think for us is again a new old solution to a new problem: create organization where it doesn't exist, um, where there are organizations and there are you know, different organizations. And that's a wonderful thing we have as a Philippine X community. We've, you know, we've uh, continued the, the, to build people's organizations. Uh, we continue to create mechanisms for people to come together uh, collectively. 
And there are lots of different organizations that have different um, you know, principles of unity that are out there, uh, whether it's, you, you know, if you feel aligned, um, there's the Malaya, there's, um, you know, and people can, um, I'm talking now, so it's hard to kind of like now go into uh, sharing in the chat, um, you know, the various organizations that are connected to Bayan or, you know, other, others uh, in California, there's the Fierce Coalition, there's uh, that's really around statewide policy, but even still trying to create mechanisms for people to be engaged in their world, in their everyday lives, right? So I think there are, um, you know, there's some lessons to be learned to what extent we can apply them. You know, I think it's still the challenge, but I think there's still um, that. Um, there's a question, so we're almost at time. We uh, thank you for Lucy, for all of the uh, resources on academic freemen and online harassment. Um, we are going to compile all these things, please, please, please. Um, if you haven't already joined the listserv, join it. Or ho I, I hope that we can follow up with a, a list of these resources. Uh, Denise, what a great question. Is the Katipunan still alive? Um, I think I would, the, the Katipunan may not be alive in the form that it existed, um, you know, oh, you know, before, but there is certainly um, resistance in the Philippines, and it in fact includes armed resistance. That is true. There are people who have had to, uh, who have felt compelled to have to take up arms to protect themselves against this, you know, the, the militarization of the Philippines. And, and it's coming in all sorts of forms. It's the military, the Philippine military, um, alongside U.S. troops. It is the police. It is paramilitary forces. Um, and so there's definitely that dynamic that we can't talk about in at length here, um, but that's certainly something that continues to be true in the Philippines. So it's 2.15, we promise to extend to the um, 15 minutes after, hoping that we can uh, uh, continue this conversation into the future. Thank you all so much for taking the hour and 15 minutes to join us. Hopefully this provided kind of more um, context, more historical background, some resources to continue to build on. Um, yes, thank you. And, and I love this comment about it's been healing. I'm glad it's also been healing. There is something about coming together again, collectively in space to learn together that doesn't just deepen under our understanding, but there is this sense of camaraderie of, of, you know, of care that we feel when we can do this together. Uh, and again, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Michael, and all the rest of the folks in the collective who've done all this work around the statements, the syllabi. Um, you know, again, Angela, thank you so much. Uh, Alejandro with uh, Amado Kaya, who's been also who helped with advertising the event, and will um, you know will help us with follow up. Okay, thank you all. Take care. Thank you.